Now, Dostoevsky, when he wrote Notes from Underground, he basically said, well, this was way before the Communist Revolution, he said he was talking about these sorts of utopian, uh, egalitarian, communitarians. He said they've got human beings completely wrong, right, right from the bottom up, because if you took the typical person, he says, if you gave them everything they possibly wanted to eat, so that all they had to ever do was eat delicious cakes, and they didn't have any other responsibilities than, what did he say, uh, indulging in the continuation of the human species, and so that if they were so happy that if you put them underwater, nothing but bubbles of bliss would float up to the surface, the first thing that people who were put in that situation would do would be to wander around smashing things, just so that something unexpected and interesting would happen. You know, it's a brilliant critique of utopianism because it's exactly right. He said, he basically, Dostoevsky said, people are so crazy that they'd rather be um, subjected to inconvenient and unexpected occurrences than just to lay there all soporific with bliss. And so that there was something wrong with the whole utopian notion, right? from the get-go, because that's just not what people are like. They'd rather have interesting trouble than non-interesting perfection. You know, and I think that's an incredibly powerful idea. But anyways, this, you can just think about that in relationship to your own character. I mean, how often do you do something that's trouble just to see what happens? I mean, it's exactly what people are like, you know. Even chimpanzees, Juvenile chimps, if they see an old male sleeping underneath the tree, they'll go and poke them with a stick just to see what happens. You know, and it's like, well, if you can't see human, humanity in that sort of behavior, there's something wrong with you. So, but the utopians offered this vision of the future, which was basically paradise on earth, but they also <coughs> proposed that it was something that could be attained through certain types of, you know, direct political action, which usually meant well, fix your neighbor up, or even worse, meant steal what he has because he shouldn't have it anyways. And the problem with the utopian vision essentially was that if my theory is associated with a future utopia in a logical way, so I can make a case to you that if you do this and we do that and they do this and we're organizing things this way, then we'll usher in a period of prosperity that's almost heavenly in its, in its promise the problem with that is it means we can do any bloody thing, bloody thing we want right now because the end product is so valuable that it justifies it. And so what happens is that the utopian vision turns into a rationale for the most destructive forms of behavior in the here and now. And then when someone's called to task for it, it's like, what the hell do you think you're doing? You know, they'll say something like, well, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. You know, and that's all well and good if you happen to be making the omelet, but it's not so damn good if you happen to be one of the eggs. And there were plenty of eggs broken on the way to, you know, the Soviet vision of success. Well, and you know, there's good evidence. Stalin, by the time the mid-1950s came around, there's pretty decent evidence from the KGB archives that he was preparing to launch a thermonuclear war against Europe. I mean, he'd already killed God only knows how many million people by that point. A few more hundred million weren't really going to weigh that heavily on his conscience. The last book I read on Stalin, which was published, which was called Stalin, it was written by a guy who had access to the KGB and Communist Party archives. He claimed that Khrushchev and three other people killed Stalin in the late 1950s to stop him from invading Europe. So, I mean, you know, in the battle between the communist utopians and the West, we came this close to wiping everything out several times. So, now, what happened in some sense was this, is that this theory was laid out to cover the world. So, the Marxist theory was presented itself as a scientific theory, an inevitable theory of history, and the theory of history was that the warfare between the oppressed and the oppressor was the primary fact of life, and that that needed to transform itself into an egalitarian utopia, and that there were certain states, that political states, that mankind would have to go through to reach that end. Okay, so that was basically the theory, and part of the theory was that in order to get to that point, then resources had to be distributed equally to all, which sounds fine in principle, but then again, the devil's always in the details, and how to distribute resources 
equally is by no means self-evident. You know, part of the reason that the English came up with the idea of the free market, this is Adam Smith fundamentally, is because Smith figured out that trying to figure out what things were worth is so complicated that you can't actually calculate it. So then we would say, well, what's your coat worth? I'd say, well, would you give me your coat for five dollars? Two dollars. Thousand dollars. Okay, so, so, but see, the point being is that, you know, there's no way of establishing the worth of things because the worth of one thing is its worth in relationship to all other things of worth. Like it's a continual interaction between all things of worth, and the only way you can make that calculation is by letting people, individual people, make micro choices and that the value of things is established as a consequence of a hundred billion micro choices. We'd call that in the modern world, we'd call something that, some, that something like distributed cognition. You know, it's like you're outsourcing a price decision to the marketplace. What's this thing worth? Well, the answer is whatever people will trade for it. And it's not a cop-out, it's, it's an illustration, indication of the fact that you can't come up with a computation that will allow you to determine what something is worth. So, I mean, I, I can give you an example of that from my own life, trying to figure out what something is worth. I developed some software to help people hire employees, and we did the mathematical calculations and figured out that if people used this particular software instead of going through an um, interview process, which doesn't work very well, that it would basically, if they used, if they gave it to ten people to select one employee, that it would save them about 35% of the salary of the hired person per year. So, if you hired someone who was being paid $100,000, then the return on investment would be $35,000 a year, and we could sell this for, say, well, we didn't know what, how much do you charge for the tests then? So you might say, well, if it's $35,000 a year, you're going to have this person around for four years, because that's how long the average person stays in their job. That's $150,000. And so then, you only have to use 10 tests, and so maybe we could take half of the first year, so that'd be $17,000, so it'd be $1,750 a test. And you'd get like a 30, what is it? You'd get a eight times return on your investment. Well, you should be just jumping at that. Well, it doesn't work like that at all. We ended up having to sell it for about $20 a test, and we could hardly sell it to anyone because, well, for, for reasons that are far too complex to go into. But, my point is, is that it's impossible to make a pricing decision. It's really, really difficult. And to think that you could make a conscious and pre-programmed pricing decision for every single commodity is completely insane, and that's what they tried to do in the Soviet Union. And I read at one point that the Central Pricing Committee had to make 10,000 pricing decisions a day. Well, you can't even come up with the price of one, you put things on Kijiji, you know, it's like, well, what's it worth? Well, you look at what everyone else is paying for it, roughly speaking, and then it depends on how quickly you want to sell it and what kind of shape it's in, and, you know, it's complicated. And you have a pricing guideline, you just have to look the damn thing up. It's still hard to figure out what the price is. But imagine you have no comparative information at all. What's a hypodermic needle worth? Well, I guess it depends on whether you need it to inject the penicillin that's going to save your life, or if you're just putting it in your cupboard to store it. But it's a complicated decision. All right, so anyways, this utopian scheme was set up, and we're acting on the proposition that people used it, at least in part, as a replacement for their alternative, for their old belief systems, which I think is a perfectly reasonable proposition. But we're also going to take a psychoanalytic approach, and we're going to say, well, it also allowed people to manifest bad faith, because if your worth can be determined by how good a cog you are in the fascist or communist machinery, it pretty much alleviates you of any responsibility that you have to have for your own life. So that for, for every positive reason that you might join a utopian movement, there's a negative reason, which is, well, you can benefit from its exploitive nature, and you don't have to take any responsibility. Well, Solzhenitsyn and Frankel both talked about that a lot, as did Nietzsche, but Frankel and Solzhenitsyn are more interesting because they actually happened to live through 
the imposition of systems like that and could see them from the inside. Solzhenitsyn's first observation was Marxist economics didn't work. Well, that was a big problem. Because it was supposed to work, and not only was it supposed to work, it was supposed to work perfectly. And what that basically meant was that if it didn't work, you only had one of two options. You could either abandon the damn system and start to complain about the fact that you had to line up for bread for four hours a day, which was perfectly typical daily activity for people, for example, in Poland and in Russia before the wall came down. Everything cost nothing, but there wasn't anything to buy, so it wasn't very much of a bargain. And instead of paying for your bread with money, you just paid for it with time. You stayed in line for two hours, or three hours, or five hours, and when you got to the front of the line at the department store, you took whatever the hell was there, because you didn't even know what it was that you were going to be buying when you joined the lineup. And so it wasn't like it was free, you just paid for it with your time. So Solzhenitsyn noted that what happened as the system continued to manifest its counterproductive properties was that either people had the choice of saying, oh, this isn't working worth a damn, there must be something rotten in Denmark, or pretending that everything was all right and lying about everything. And that's what they did. They lied about everything, and so you got, to, you got the situation up to the point where in East Germany, before the wall came down, one out of every three people was a government informer. So that meant if you had a family of six people, two of them were telling the government what you were talking about at dinner. And that was their duty. And so what that meant in these societies was no one ever said anything that they meant, ever. And if they did, the probability that the KGB was going to kick down their door at four in the morning um, and take them off to the central prison before dumping them in some damn camp where they'd never see anybody they ever knew for the rest of their life was extraordinarily high. So you watched everything you said and everything you thought around your wife, around your brother, around your sister, around your children and the whole system ground onward in a mire of absolute deception and lies.